Today's project will be the first of several completed with this buckskin. If you're interested in how I made it, that video is linked on screen and down below. One of those future projects requires 12 continuous feet of a quarter inch wide strip. So before cutting out my quiver pieces, I'll trim away the rough edges and cut one strip around the outside of the hide. Now to lay out the quiver pieces, I'll start by tracing out the main body, 14 inches wide at the top, 12 inches wide at the bottom, and 38 inches long. The taper isn't absolutely necessary, I just like the look and the extra fletching space. Depending upon your material and preferences, you may also want to size down slightly overall as this is a fairly large quiver. After cutting out the main piece, you also need to cut out the strap. I'm cutting two strips, one and a half inches by 36 inches to be joined together later. Again, this may vary for you depending upon your quiver design and body size. Quick commercial, if you need arrows, go get them from Ryan Gill. His website is linked below. My quiver length is based on arrow size and mine are 31 inches. I'm leaving roughly 3 inches of arrow exposed to the knock end, which gives me about 10 inches to split between bottom fringe and the top cuff. This also takes into account the seam at the bottom, which you'll see shortly. So you can see, I've indicated with pencil lines where my bottom seam will be and where my cuff will be folded. With the exterior surface of my quiver facing up, I'll fold the bottom fringe inward at the seam and fold the quiver in half lengthwise. Starting just inside the corner of the two folds, I'm going to punch my holes to start sewing. Because this hide is very thick and four layers deep here, I'm also opening the holes a bit more with my awl. My tools for this build may not be 100% primitive, but the materials are. So in keeping with that, I'm using real sinew to sew this together. It is significantly more abrasion resistant than fake or imitation sinew, and even if a stitch did break, it's unlikely that the seam would come apart, as sinew holds a rigid shape and bonds to itself once dry. A good trick for getting a needle unstuck, or through a tight seam, is to use soft jaw pliers. The plastic jaws prevent damage from occurring to the needle, while giving significantly more leverage than what your fingers can apply on their own. Now the trick to successfully using sinew as thread is to get it completely saturated prior to sewing with it. Some people prefer a dish of water for this, but it's more convenient and probably more historically accurate to gently chew it, letting your saliva take care of this process. As far as consistency, you want it to be soft and supple, but not mushy. Keep in mind that it swells slightly when wet, so make sure you account for that when you process it into strands. Something really convenient about its drying process is that when it shrinks, it will draw the seam a little tighter. Sinew does have some limitations, one being length. Even back sinew from large animals like elk won't give you a long enough strand to finish a whole quiver. I like to sew in segments of two to four inches at a time, often doubling back over my seam. Punching short runs at a time helps keep the holes aligned well, but if you wanted to punch a whole seam, you could adhere it with hide glue prior to punching your holes. For my stitch work, I use saddle stitch, but with only one needle. I'll explain that with a visual here shortly. First, I'm finishing this bottom seam, and then opening the quiver to trim about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge of the fringe. This will keep it from interfering with the side seam. Alright, so saddle stitch. The way this method works is by creating a seam with a stitch that goes back and forth through the material. You'll see that as I go back and forth, it leaves an every other stitch pattern. And in traditional saddle stitch, you just use the other half of the strand with a second needle, and it will cover all of those missing stitches. My method varies slightly in that I prefer focusing on one needle at a time, so I always backstitch over the gaps, or come back with the other half of the strand later. But essentially, all you need to worry about is following the back and forth pattern and somehow accounting for all of the stitches. Which you can see me doing here.
Once finished, it should look like this. I'm going to repeat this all the way to the line for my top fold, where I'll finish by reinforcing the top of the seam as shown. Next up is adding the stiffening rod, and this can simply be an unused arrow shaft or dowel. Mine is a debarked red twig dogwood shoot from my arrow shaft pile. To attach it, I'll slide it into my currently inside out quiver, keeping it along the seam side, and then starting at the bottom, I'll punch two holes and then sew a stitch there, repeating this about every four to six inches until I reach the end of the seam. Then I'll just trim up all my loose ends. At this point, the quiver needs to be turned right side out. So after letting my sinew dry, I removed the rod and began that task. Thicker or stiffer material and smaller quiver dimensions definitely increase the difficulty level. Now with the quiver right side out, the rod can be replaced by sliding it under each of the stitches. With that in place, I'm going to trim my fringe. It's purely decorative, so I'm just choosing a pattern that I like. I enjoy having opposing angles on the two sides as it creates a pleasing effect. Then I'll cut the individual strands. I actually ended up coming back to thin them a bit more after the first time through. On the other end, it's time to fold back the cuff. The nice thing about this extra material is that it not only looks good, but if you happen to get caught in some wet weather, you could fold it back up over your fletchings to cover them. This is also a good time to trim this rod down since I'd like a little overhang, but not too much. Functionally speaking, you could just cut it flush. To join my strap pieces, I'm overlapping them by a couple of inches and then running a few seams along that section. When it's time to attach the strap to the quiver, I want it to be fully adjustable, both for balance and hanging height, which is why I like having the exposed rod to mount the strap to. That way, the strap length and mounting points can be easily adjusted later without significant changes being made to the quiver. So I'll place the straps about where I think they should be, and check how it hangs. I like one strap fairly close to the top of the quiver, while the other is roughly half to two-thirds the way to the bottom. You can see I have the quiver close to waist height, and with arrows it's pretty well balanced. You want to be able to cleanly draw arrows, and the strap should be mounted so that the quiver never tips forward and dumps the arrows out. Once I've made sure I like the mounting position, I'll mark it on both straps. Then I'll lay out and cut holes for lacing them together. The advantage to cutting rather than punching these holes is that it creates significantly more friction and a better hold on the lacing. Now I'll cut a few thin strips and attach the strap. This could be done up however you like, but here's my method. Starting from the front, I'm pushing each end of the lace through the lower holes in both straps. Then from the back, I'll push them through the opposite top holes only through the rear strap making an X shape between them. From between the straps, I'll push them back through the lower holes in the front strap, and then tie them together. After which I'll put them through opposing top holes back to the middle and tie them again. Here's the whole process once more on the other end. The reason behind my approach to this is based on how I want to attach my bow. This isn't really a necessity, I just like having the option to carry my bow on the quiver, 
or display it on my wall that way. After the strap is secured, I'm cutting a nice looking angle on each of its ends and then cutting another hole for securing the bow to each strap. I'm using the excess material I left at the corner of this cuff to make a pocket. I'll start by cutting a slit for access and then fold this corner over and sew two seams to make the pocket. This is a very specialized pocket as it will give me easy access to a natural wind checker while hunting. After I finish the quiver, I'll show you what that looks like. With the pocket sewn up, I'm going to add a knife attachment system via two small straps. These are simple, will accept a knife and its sheath, and be able to hold various sizes, which is convenient if I want to swap out the knife that I'm carrying. And I could easily remove them or make them more permanent if I wanted to. Now that the functional pieces are complete, I'll add some embellishments, starting with laces, beads, and feathers on the strap, followed by some natural dyes to decorate and darken the quiver. I'm attaching some lace to the strap here by cutting two holes next to each other and feeding the lace through both holes from the back side. Then I can thread on my handmade beads. This first one is made of wood from a tree that was planted by John Chapman. The one in the middle is antler from my first buck when I was 11, and the top one is a different style of the same wood as the first. They're all held simply by friction fit. I've drilled a hole in each of these polished shell pieces that will allow me to attach them with sinew to the strap. So I start by making three holes for sewing them on, one through the shell and one to each side. Then attaching them is as simple as threading the sinew through the center hole and alternating between the side holes until it's sufficiently stable. And then just repeating that for each shell. As for the feathers, I'm attaching them by using sinew to fasten them to the laces, starting with turkey wing feathers at the bottom and a crow feather at the top. Then adding another turkey feather at the back and blue jay and cardinal feathers at the front. Lastly, I'm mixing up some charcoal dyes for designs and coloring. I'm not going to get too intricate, but I want some patterns on the strap. This dye is from tulip wood charcoal and produces a nice rich black. The second brownish dye is an underburnt bone char, which I'm using in conjunction with the wood charcoal to dull the bright golden color of the quiver. I've got a couple more handy tidbits for field use if you plan on making one of these and hunting with it. So first, here's the wind checker I was referring to earlier. It's as simple as carrying some milkweed fluff in an easy to access location. The great thing about this stuff is it works just as well as powders do, but it doesn't dissipate in the wind. So even after it's quite a distance from you, it's still allowing you to read the wind. The second deals with cushioning your arrows. 
To help minimize movement or bumping points against each other, a few handfuls of dried grass can be added to the bottom of the quiver. This isn't a perfect solution, but it is primitive in materials, and that's my main goal. It's still good to place the arrows carefully back in the quiver so as not to break off the tip or find serrations on a point. Here's a few finished shots and a couple other quivers I have made. I want to touch on one last point about material. Buckskin and specifically white-tailed deer is a totally viable option for quiver making, but you want to make sure it's thick or rigid enough not to impede placing or removing arrows, and you don't want it to stretch too much in the strap. My first buckskin quiver had that issue and I ended up removing the strap, stretching it out, and braiding it with more buckskin. If you stuck this video out to the end, thank you. I hope it was helpful or entertaining, and hopefully I'll see you again with more projects very soon. Who knows what's next, but I guarantee there will be more bow builds and related videos coming up this year. Take care, guys.